počátkem 90. let minulého století byl na oběžnou dráhu země dopraven jeden z nejvýznamnějších vesmírných dalekohledů. Hubbleův teleskop. Jen o pár měsíců později byla jako první polistopadová fakulta Masarykovy univerzity založena ekonomicko-správní fakulta. Dvě takto významné události v rozmezí několika měsíců. Náhoda? Nemyslím si. Zatímco budoucnost toho zmiňovaného dalekohledu je kvůli opotřebení předmětem několika odborných diskuzí, ekonomicko-správní fakulta se těší výborné kondici, do budoucna hledí hrdě s ambiciozními plány a cíly. Dámy a pánové, vy tady v publiku, i vy, kteří nás sledujete na online streamu, buďte vítáni na konferenci Minulost, současnost a budoucnost. Ta je jakýmsi vrcholem oslav 30-letého výročí naší školy, ekonomicko-správní fakulty Masarykovy univerzity. Mé jméno je Aleš Kohout a jsem rád, že mohu být vaším průvodcem dnešním programem, který bude bohatý a zajímavý. O tom se ostatně za chviličku dozvíte vy sami. Nicméně na začátku musím zmínit základní hygienická pravidla. Poprosím vás, abyste dodržovali pravidlo, a které se týká respirátorů. Prosím, mějte respirátory nasazené. Nemusíte je mít pouze ve chvíli, kdy Protože něco já konzumujete. Mluvit, já. já musím mluvit, jak začnu mluvit, buďme tak slyším k sobě, se, prosím, ohledu plní, buďme obezřetní, protože myslím si, že mluvím za nás a za všechny, když no, řeknu, přesně tak, že no. letos už bychom rádi za nějaký Kdybych jenom poslouchal, tak to stačí, ale jak já musím mluvit, tak slyším sebe, nebo pracovali pře, v sám sebe. Nicméně tak musím také zmínit, že i přes tato možná omezující nařízení, je úžasné, že jsme se tady všichni mohli sejít. Čeká nás den plný zajímavých postřehů, podnětů a názorů. A teď nemyslím jenom oficiální program, jehož součástí je i panelová diskuze, která je naplánovaná na 10.40. Víte, sound transmission so i hope it will take a few minutes and the problem will be solved diskuzi pokud se rozhlédnete kolem sebe vidíte inspirativní lidi no a dnes máme právě příležitost pustit se do konverzace napříč obory a napříč postaveními studenti mají možnost popovídat si s zástupci partnerských organizací a firem a ti zase se členy univerzit a státní zprávy. Prostě a jednoduše, naším cílem je, abyste odsud dnes odcházeli nejenom s dobrou náladou, ale především s hlavou plnou dobrých nápadů. No a pro tuto konverzaci rozpravu můžete využít přestávku, která je plánovaná po desáté hodině. Tam můžete také ochutnat naši netradičně zbarvenou růžovou kávu, která je po celou dobu konference samozřejmě zadarmo. No a pokud zvolíte formu občerstvení v našem filtrmaku, tedy vodu, můžete si zapůjčit, opakuji, zapůjčit, Kelímek One Cup. Vy všichni víte, že škola ráda podporuje studenty, kteří mají nápady, dobré nápady a právě One Cup je projekt jednoho z našich studentů. Takže jestli se vám tento kelímek zalíbí, tento zapůjčený kelímek zalíbí, tak si můžete potom ten svůj pořídit na One Cup online shopu. No a když už jsem u těch úspěšných studentů, potažmo absolventů, Víte, kolik z nich by rádo znovu studovalo naši školu? A nebo jaký je průměrný nástupní plat našich absolventů? A nebo z jakých nejvzdálenějších koutů světa uh, sem studenti přiletěli? Tak odpovědi na tyto zajímavé otázky naleznete na našem speciálním webu, který vznikl právě v příležitosti 30. výročí a vy se na něj dostanete díky QR kódu, který naleznete na svých vysačkách. A pokud se chcete přihlásit na zdejší Wi-Fi síť, tak tady máte heslo. Po případě to heslo naleznete, a teď nebudu daleko od pravdy, na téměř každém sloupu v předsálí. 
Když jsem u toho, o čem dnešní konference je, minulost, současnost, budoucnost, musím také zmínit, že partnerem je KPMG. Děkujeme. A naším cílem je reflektovat současný stav a přinést vizi do budoucna. Hlavním řečníkem dnešního programu bude pan profesor Jan Švejnar. A já mám velkou radost, že mohu pozvat přítomné studenty na diskuzi s ním, která bude probíhat v posluchárně 104 a to ve 13.30. Jak bude fakulta za dalších 30 let vypadat, jak bude vypadat náš student, tak o tom si můžeme udělat v druhé polovině programu obrázek na základě kresby, kterou tady pro nás během druhé poloviny programu vytvoří Petr Mores. Ale to už hodně předbíhám. Pojďme se vrátit zpátky sem na toto místo tady a teď. Já bych rád pozval pana děkana ekonomicko-správní fakulty, pana profesora Jiřího Špalka, aby svou řečí oficiálně zahájil dnešní konferenci. Pane děkane, agora je vaše. Všem kritice, kolegyně, kolegové, já vás všechny srdečně vítám na hlavním dní našich oslav. My jsme i kvůli časům, které prožíváme, ale i protože si myslíme, že je rozumné slavit i tím, že se budeme zamýšlet nad budoucností, tak jsme tu dnešní konferenci, nebo tu dnešní oslavu pojali spíše jako konferenci, jako místo, kde se zamyslíme nad tím, jednak kde jsme jako fakulta a kam jsme došli za těch 30 let, ale o něco více nás zajímá, co je před námi. Ta konference má v, ve svém názvu slovo budoucnost a já bych byl rád, bychom se právě tomuhle slovu tady věnovali dneska nejvíce. Cílem té panelové diskuze by mělo být trochu se zamyslet nad tím, kam by měla ekonomicko-správní fakulta a obecně možná univerzitní vzdělávání v budoucnosti kráčet, jaké absolventy bychom chtěli tady mít a samozřejmě tomu, jakou bychom měli přizpůsobit výuku. Já nebudu mluvit o minulosti ekonomicko-správní fakulty, protože jednak už můj předřečník toho řekl hodně, jednak máme skvěle připravený web, na který vás zvu a kde se dozvíte velmi zajímavé podrobnosti, ale taky najdete i archivní fotky pro ty, kteří jste tady třeba studovali nebo působili dříve tak si můžete připomenout časy, kdy fakulta sídlila na zeleném trhu nebo na Antonínské v Brně. Já jsem velice rád, že tady vidím spoustu tváří, které se k nám vrací po letech. Velice si toho vážím, že i mezi panelisty máme absolventy, což je asi nejlepší vizitka fakulty. Když se podíváme na pozice, na kterých působí naši absolventi, tak můžeme být na sebe velmi pišní, protože na to, že jsme vznikli teprve před 30 lety, tak si myslím, že ve veřejném prostoru už hrajeme poměrně velkou roli. Takže já vás všechny vítám na konferenci, doufám, že si ji užijete. Uh, I cordially welcome our friends and colleagues from abroad, which joined our conference and, and, and I encourage you to join the discussion and uh, enjoy the conference. So, uh, welcome. Takže ještě jednou všechny vás vítám a těším se i na setkávání Mimo, mimo tady tuhle místnost čeli v kuloárech. Děkuji. Děkujeme, pane děkane, za vaše slova. Dámy a pánové, nyní je čas pozvat hlavního řečníka dne, významného ekonoma a spoluzakladatele CRGEI, pana profesora Jana Švejnara. Děkuji. Mnohokrát dovolte, abych začal právě tím poděkováním panu rektorovi, panu děkanovi, profesorskému sboru a pogratuloval vám k tomu, že jste založili fakultu už před 30 lety. Je to opravdu velký krok, významný krok, mnohé se docílili. V porovnání s tím třeba na Karlově univerzitě taková fakulta stále ještě neexistuje, takže jste průkopníci i v této, v této oblasti. A je to důležité, protože po 30 letech většinou se říká, že instituce už jsou etablované, 
že do 30 let není jasné, jestli přežijí, v jaké kvalitě a tak dále. A de facto 30 let je takový ten bod, mezník, kde opravdu se říká, že ta instituce už nabyla té zetitosti ve smyslu, že zůstane a bude se dál rozvíjet. Takže jsem velice rád, že konáte tuto konferenci, že si to uvědomujete a že máte jasné cíle, kam, kam směřujete. A já bych úvodem řekl pár slov o tom, jak vidím, jak se vyvinula ekonomie jako věda a její aplikace, s tím, že bych potom na konci poukázal trochu na to globální situaci, jak se vlastně vyvíjejí ekonomiky, které dávají důraz, a některé méně, některé více, právě na ekonomický aspekt, jak se společnost vede a kam, kam to zacílili. Neváhejte i během mého úvodního slova, zvedněte ruku, otázku, odpovědi, vyjasnění. Uh, so please feel free to participate even when I am uh, uh, doing the introductory uh, speech here. Uh, takže, jo, promiňte, dáme to takto na takhle. Je to lepší, jo, dobře, tak jo, fajn. Uh, takže, takže čistě, já ještě z, z mojeho hlediska, čistě abyste chápali, já jsem vyrůstal samozřejmě zde, z toho Pražáku vodem, ale v 17 so, it works now. We are sorry for the delay. When I was 17, it was a coincidence that I came to the USA, where I was, I'm sorry, it's better without the mask, where I was studying my master's studies, and then I was at the University of Michigan and in Pittsburgh, and I've been at the Columbia University for 10 years. So I've been in many places around the world, including developing countries. So my view, of course, arises from my experience and from how the economies are developing. So there has been great progress since the Second World War. Economics was an institutional science before. It was not so technically oriented. And the big change happened in the 50s when the chief economists, big names, started developing economics as a science, as a theory, and it was based more and more on mathematical foundations. So it took many decades for economics to reach the same mathematical patterns as physics and other nature sciences. In parallel with that, statistical methods were also evolving, so the whole field of econometrics was important. The focus of research moved from Europe to the USA, and there the science was evolving along with Europe. But the focus moved to the USA to a big extent. And then the individual fields and subfields were flourishing and developing within the field of economics. The economics of labor, for instance, was developing. It is still a field. It's an, it's an applied science with statistical methods and mathematical methods used for testing theories and hypotheses and the development continues. There was a change of thinking because economics was about how the stakeholders act and behave. And in the 60s, big research started in the theory of games where strategic interaction became an important element of research and it was really a revolution in economic thinking and this was transferred on all the all the fields so economics reached a level where in the top institutes the scholars they were they had a degree in economics or in mathematics, a doctoral degree. So it did not really matter which technical apparatus was used, and economics became a royal science, a royal social science, because 
it was accepted as a science with no with the same limits as the other fields and it is facing huge challenges because it is studying a changing environment it is not studying things in test tubes but in a society because people and businesses are changing their behavior so doing good science is essential and the economists managed what people had not even been dreaming of so every decade there was huge progress in in developed economies there was a clear impact but there was impact also in emerging and developing economies where big mathematical models were used as the markets were imperfect not developed they were studying approaches to see how the patterns were developing and also in the methods they were using planning elements and it is Im it is interesting to compare what was going on in one third of the world in the centrally planned economies where economics was a branch of Marxism and Leninism and it was partly planned there were really technical approaches how to best plan the society and these models were now used in developing countries as well and prices were one of the regulators one of the elements that can affect the way the economy behaves and acts and because before it was the prices played only a passive role and quantitative approaches were the main thing so these were two worlds two parallel worlds and there was big emphasis on the development and testing of theories a lot of interesting knowledge arose from this and one is related to Brno because before the Second World War there was a student Jacob Minzer an economist and together with Gary Becker they came with the theory of human capital so it's not only the human capital but uh, when people are educated let's say at this faculty it's a big investment in the capital in human capital and it is something what can be systematically followed studied analyzed and for the individuals and society it can be allocated it's an economic phenomenon and an important one back then something like 20 years ago I came to visit the University of Columbia I was back then working at a different university and Jacob Minzer was a senior professor and we had a seminar with critical opinions and so on and at the end he took me aside and he was crying he had tears in his eyes he said I was studying in Brno and I learned the maths which I then used in the development of the human capital model which has become an important model and we have still been using it so the city of Brno was the cradle for this whole industry which is an important one so it's interesting to see what was going on back then the economics was evolving and several specializations and subfields spinned off for instance the economic development theory and recently there has been an important 
general approach, which is an experimental approach. The economists for the last 20, 30 years have been focused on experimental approach, where on top of using econometrics as the empirical approach, they have also been using random randomized control trials, that means randomized testing, random sampling, like in, in other industries. This is something which is controversial to a degree, like every time something new comes, but it has become an important domain and even the Nobel Prize was awarded to this subfield of the economics. And it is important for us that in the 90s, when centrally planned economies were being transferred to market economies, we could see this sort of big bang, how market economies are set up. And that is something what could be studied and in established developed economies, we don't see this anymore because they're sort of in this steady state, things are changing, but not that dramatically. So it was here where we started doing a lot of studies that were very indicative in terms of the economic policy, how we can adapt existing knowledge in the 90s, we were facing the big question of unemployment. Unemployment appeared. It had not existed before. And the question was, what was the right economic policy? What is going on in established economies? So in the, it was called transit economies in the 90s. And we were based on population sampling, we were trying to find out that unemployed people could were strongly responding to unemployment benefits because they were still looking for a job instead of sort of staying at home, getting lazy and stopping the search. And this was important because it showed that it makes sense that the governments do provide unemployment benefits, at least for some time, because it helped the people find new job opportunities. And it was also important from the political point of view, because the support among the population for huge transformation was needed in the new democracies, because voters were voting. So we saw that in the Czech Republic, the politicians who started kicked off the revolution and transformation, they stayed in power for longer than, for instance, in Slovakia or Poland, where there was a double-digit unemployment and the population was not willing to go ahead with quick reforms. And that also contributed to the split of Czechoslovakia, because in Slovakia there was a double-digit unemployment, while in the Czech Republic the unemployment was very low. So the pace of economic transformation was also preconditioned by the situation on the labor market, by the economic situation as it was. In the panel discussion, we will have participants who are academics as well as practical oriented, practically oriented people. So what has been evolving since the 50s are specialized faculties and schools, business schools, trade faculties of administration, trade or business, and they have been becoming an important player in research and the collaboration between and for collaboration between businesses and schools. And those who spent a lot of money and effort on this and came to the top they were on the same level as economic faculties and the, the interchange of opinions was fully integrated because it was not 
people with different foundations or approaches or education to, to knowledge. And the same was going on for schools that were focused on the economic policies, public and international affairs, who were taking a lot of effort in analyzing the lessons and teaching and integration with the rest of the university. So here I must say that what we were seeing as, as a development of science and its application, this was spreading and became became part of the process in the developed world. What is also interesting about the application is that eventually we can see that economies and governments that heavily invested in economics and were willing to share this knowledge with practical fields, these made huge progress. To be specific, I mean China. China was an underdeveloped country and contrary to all expectations in the year 1978 when the economic reforms were started and China was dramatically investing in human capital including economics, it made a huge leap forward and it has become one of countries that are a driving force of the world economy. And we can see the interlinking between education, investments and application. I could show you a few charts, if I may. Just take a look at the structure of the world economy. In the year 1978, that's the start of the China reforms, gross national income in the US dollars. We took, well, like if, as if we took what they produce and put it on the world market and say how much it was. So the USA and the EU is more than one half of the world economy and they are the main driving force. And Japan also very strong, 11%, China. 2%, Russia, 9%, India, India, Brazil, and rest of the world. This is what the world was like. And if we went back even farther, we could see that the West was the absolutely dominant force in the world economy like we saw in education, where education was the strongest. When we take a look at the year 2018, that means now, we see that the, U the America and Europe have been declining. It's the steepest decline in the importance of big entities in modern history of the world economy. But China has 16% by growing so fast during the last three years it has been accelerating so china has been growing europe is declining the us also declined from 20 to, to 24 percent but the fluctuation is not that big but the european union dropped to 22 it's a massive drop and this is something we should really take seriously because Europe at the beginning of the 90s, Europe and Japan pretty much reached the level of the USA and it was discussed in general literature where and how Europe and Japan will exceed the USA. So this did not happen. But on the contrary, the US was heavily investing in digital technologies and Europe was lagging behind and they made a big more progress than Europe. But China, China is the biggest phenomenon. We really see huge growth and it's the biggest challenge. How on this aggregate level, I mean continental countries, 
what is the way to go. And one last example is that when we look at the global economy in the year 1820, according to the best possible data we could have, Professor Madison was counting it. So you can see that it was China, it was mostly China and India that were representing half of the world economy. So the question is to what extent what we have what we saw back then and what we are seeing now we can see China going forward so the question is where what is the future of the world economy like I said this is preconditioned by investments in in economic education primarily and in education as such and in in the application in in the business sector how the businesses are growing Europe and Japan have lost relative significance in the world economy so these are important lessons and one more lesson I want to add I don't have it in any chart what's going on with economies that hit a certain ceiling and cannot break through it let's say over twelve thousand dollars per year the latin american countries are a good example of that we've been studying this we are trying to find out why and china is obviously going to to push through this ceiling and continue like many other countries in Asia and South Asia and it appears that the driving engine is investment in education investment in high quality education is extremely important one of the models which was prepared and has empirical verification and is powerful is a model saying that the winner takes all or almost all and excellence is important excellence and very high quality because mediocrity has been paying off less and less so on the level of individuals on the level of countries continents excellence is essential and China has been very smart in this because they sent tens of thousands of most talented people young people to all possible world universities and many of them came back and when you check the international university rankings then you can see that China now has two universities in the first 50 best universities or even better according to some rankings and there are many universities that that have been following so I'm um, getting back to your faculty it is extremely important that this faculty was founded it is extremely important that you have big goals because in the global context it means that we as a country and we as a continent as the European Union we are facing a huge challenge and who will play the major role and of course this role the relative role of the USA, Europe and China and East Asia will be very important. There's, there's also the political context which is also essential. The difference in the competition between Western market economies and the model China has been representing state capitalism let's call it where there is very strong control by the communist party and the state but at the same time there is market economy so it is a different nature than what the cold war was because since the 70s 80s we have known very well that the, the soviet economy is not strong it was not clear when it's going to collapse and how fast but there was no competition there was competition in nuclear weapons and in ideology but not in the economy it was obvious that the economy is not performing well in China it's the other way around 
China has been very powerful and very high performing. In no other country in Asia have they managed to grow so quickly for, for so long. If there's going to be a break point in China, then there will be a big challenge. And I would like to say that this is a challenge resting upon human capital. And there is one more piece of statistics from the USA. They sometimes do inventories of different types. And one was what is the overall structure of capital in the US. And they found out that roughly three fourths of all capital in the US is a human capital. The rest is buildings, machines, and so on. But three thirds of everything, that's the estimation, is the human capital. So education, top education, excellent education is something we have to support. And I believe that your faculty is a pioneer in this. So we can open the discussion now. These two charts that show the share of the individual countries on the gross domestic product uh, take uh, into respect the size of the countries in the European Union, uh, because uh, if that chart only considers the only original 17 countries, uh, then the drop in Europe is dramatic. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Yes, it considers the original countries and it uh, compares the So, Professor, what do you think the European Union should do to stop lagging behind? Because it looks that we will be behind, we stay conserved in our uh, comfort and we'll start looking because the Czech Republic alone cannot do it all, I mean the whole European Union. I believe Europe was doing pretty well since the Second World War until the 80s, the German miracle and miracles all over. But at the, the beginning of the 90s, there happened something which we are investigating still, and it's still not clear, but the involvement of digital technologies uh, was something that scientists in both America and Europe participated in, but then the European economic policy was accentuating this very little. And in America was the dot-com bubble era. There was a lot of inefficiency. Much money was spent in vain, but they bet on the good digital card and uh, gave rise to the gigantic digital companies. And when we look at 20 biggest digital companies in the world, so uh, in the 90s, there were seven uh, from Europe. But now there's just one, maybe, and not, not even one, which would be on the top. And it's very difficult to catch up. So take all the important uh, startups here in Europe, uh, Avast here, for instance. They want to be purchased. They want to be acquisitioned by a large company, uh, which is not European. So it's very difficult to create um, 
a phenomenon while the field is dominated by companies that are not from Europe. And it's a question how to proceed forward. And Europe has to be uh, more convinced about the goal. In the year 2000, Europe declared that by 2010, it would be um, uh, the most developed part of the world's economy. So, uh, and it hasn't happened. So they said 2020, we're in 2021 and still nothing happens. So the push to the goal, the vision can be there, but, uh, but it's not implemented. So the goal is to implement with the thank with the aid of the human capital, which exists, there are top um, mathematics, uh, physicists, chemists uh, on both continents. The question is how to use that capital. Sorry, I can't hear the question. Did that play a role in Britain's decision for the Brexit. I think it played some role. Uh, we had some conference and the colleagues from Britain said that they are surprised that the Britons who voted for Brexit, who were later affected negatively, uh, for instance, Japanese automotive industry will move to the continent. So all the voters are still for Brexit, despite all these negative effects. So there was still some uh, notion of what Britain meant, has meant and means. And it's difficult when an em empire that Britain used to be uh, ceases to be part of the world economy. Roles of political. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Please use the microphone. What's surprising that Europe has been able to perform so well, and uh, suddenly China has stepped in and it's a clash of systems. So for so many years, despite the mentality of the people and the cultural heritage, it is able to generate the speed, the pace of the economic growth. And although the statistics are not precise, it is a steep growth. So far, it has seemed that the system is functioning, but suddenly now there is a clash between the entrepreneurs and the communi Communist Party, the system. It can lead to some changes. Uh, we've seen the Cultural Revolution and it hasn't worked in China, but the trend is very uh, general and long-term. I would like to thank you very much that you accepted our invitation and uh, my question will be naive as a non-economist. So you said that the key investment, uh, key factor is the investment in education. So we are aware of the uh, uh, difficulties um, in reaching the charts of uh, top education. So there is an enormous growth of universities in China. That, so there are two in the 
top 15. Perhaps there are some, uh, there's Cambridge Zurich or the United French Universities in the top, but uh, with all the knowledge of our capacity uh, here, we are aware of that. We do not take the charts into account, but the charts will not wait for us. The potential will not wait for us forever. So do you think there is some correlation? It's a very n important question. All the ranking indexes are not perfect, but there are some certain uh, presumptions, but we need to have a reserved approach, but it does correlate. But if you are in top 20 or top 400, there is a, dif a difference. So don't look if you're at 360, but to, it is important to be aware where you are and to see uh, how the uh, cooperation among the top uh, universities functions. It is a fluent flow of students, professors, uh, and inter um, um, face with industry. I have worked at the uh, International School of uh, International Relations and it, the integration, seamless integration, is very important uh, because the uh, interlacing with non-profit sphere, governmental institutions. It's very important because the economy is enriched by everyone functioning on the same level, and everyone is after the excellence. And this is why the American and Chinese uh, economy are doing so well, is the quest for excellence, the effort to find the best. And your colleague asked a question, what's Europe to do about this? And this is what I think, the excellence, the model of the winner takes it all. It's also like Wimbledon or tennis tournament. The winner gets all the money and all the fame. Everybody else is very good, but they, they don't get the profit. And I think that Europe is lagging behind in this. My personal example, uh, at the age of 17, when I was catapulted to, the, to Western Europe, I had to leave the country one month before graduating from the secondary school, so from the college. So you know, no university wanted to accept me in Europe. And I asked in America, and they said, well, yeah, you may be a special case. Come for a year, and we will transfer all your credits, and you will become a regular student. And I went to America. And after eight years, when I went through the bachelor, master, and doctoral studies as a young assistant professor, I went to Europe. And I always started my lectures <laughs> uh, saying I was hoping, eight years ago, I was hoping to start studying here. But, and most universities keep telling me, we couldn't accept you even these days. We are so bound with the rules, even a genius wouldn't have a chance here. America in its flexibility, in its willing to experiment, to take the risk, the possibility to uh, do it for, for the teachers and the students, that was significant for the possibility 
and for what we see around. The Chinese students, for instance. She, uh, I had a Chinese student uh, studying um, economy, economics, and, and uh, she had a Chang University. She had a possibility to study in Europe and in America. The Chinese university accepted her but sent her to America for one semester, keeping her on the level uh, uh, that they want you. And this is what you do there, and uh, you will continue to do that in China. Imagine how many universities would be willing to proceed in this way How can this chart be affected by two elements uh, the, uh, that we see suddenly, COVID and the um, climate change, the European Green Deal? Um, how do these trends function? Both of these are important factors. COVID affected the whole world. <laughs> although it, yeah, it came from China with most probability. But still, their system allows them to be so authoritative to suppress the effects. But it has in its effect, and its economic drop hasn't appeared in China so much as it has in Europe and America. But it is a question, how will they deal with it uh, towards the future? But they had some experience with the previous SARS epidemics, so they were more prepared for the pandemic. But this is an effect that is very strong worldwide, but it is stronger in some countries, in on some continents, than on others, but it will be more beneficial for China in short term. Uh, with regard to the Green Deal, this is the uh, heading of the whole world, uh, the direction where it's heading, and it depends on the speed we're taking. China signed the Paris Treaty, but is affected by very few limitations. They are trying to get some uh, clean air uh, climate in Shanghai, but still they are opening uh, coal power plants in China. Um, I'm s convinced that America will move in that direction with Biden now, not as quick as Europe, so they are um, moving in the direction which will be beneficiary for the population, but the starting costs, the initial costs uh, will be immense. India is very clear. They say we are in the faces of economic uh, development. So you've been polluting the world for, for ages, so don't force us to adopt this. Uh, you're rich, we're still very poor. This is a very strong argument. I can't hear the question, I'm sorry. I believe that in the last 10-15 years, the research shows that stimuli for small children, one or two years old, the intellectual stimulus is very important on all levels, so uh, it makes no sense 
to get oriented on the small children, b bigger children. I believe that the Czech system on the elementary school or uh, college, it, the Czech education was of high quality. When I came to America to Cornell University, the basics, what I had from the secondary school, the, the college, uh, the knowledge was equal to the elite students of American colleges. I had to uh, catch up with my English, but uh, within the scope of PISA, uh, we, PISA, we are dropping down and I would like to go back to what I've said before, the integration with the sector where we apply education is important. The industrial sphere, governmental institution, non-profit institutions, there are countries where it works well and they accentuate this and the individuals are uh, who want to go for profit, go to go to uh, private schools, uh, and those who want to go to the public sector uh, do what they want to in their sphere, but they understand each other, and it works, it correlates. dependency on China and the crisis in the industrial sector in China, so lack of chips, for instance, how will it affect other economics, other economies? When it works well, the model that evolved in the global economy, we relied on the just-in-time delivery, but the system is vulnerable because when you get a shock, as the pandemic, for instance, and it's n impossible to renew the deliveries uh, on time, we see the growth of prices, late deliveries, uh, mm, growth of raw material prices. But now the question is how much temporal it is and uh, the question is to renew these uh, possibilities, but I believe it will be deglobalized and we will use local companies and on the other hand we will invest in uh, digital technologies worldwide and this will recompensate for uh, this drop and uh, the f strong economies will be able to go on to recuperate and it shows that American economy is much more flexible and stronger than the European economy and we must think about it and make some paces, make some steps to make Europe as flexible as America. In research we're doing for the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg. We are sampling companies all over the world in Europe and America. And one of the research projects that we're doing is the, is Europe more less effective than the US uh, with the allocation of the employment capital, human capital, uh, is the allocation because the the uh, because America is not a perfect economy, but it is much better allocated than Europe. So our guess is that if Europe were better allocated than that, uh, the GDP would be forty percent higher. So. I see the great potential of Europe. If we simplify this, in America they must innovate because they do not have the reserve 
for the inefficiency. They can innovate, but uh, they can recuperate, but not very much. They must innovate. Europe has the economic capital, human capital. It must innovate, but if it worked in the area of inefficiency gaps, it can move forward. In the light of these figures, what about the European social system? Is that a setback? Are Europeans uh, willing to give up on the benefits? I think that the European social model is all right, but it must be used reasonably. If the expected uh, life expectancy is prolonged by 20 years, uh, and we think that everybody in the old age pension age can collect uh, all those benefits, it is simply not achievable. It is not sustainable. Health um, status has improved, but the age of retirement should move to higher age. So uh, there are more examples, but in that respect, the uh, social model is fine. It's better than the American model. America is good for young, healthy people, but uh, it's not good for people who are old and uh, ill and, and not wealthy. So in this respect, yes, the European model should work, but should allocate the money to the areas where it is needed. And it should force the people to be productive if they can to make the model find the benefits and minimize the disadvantages. It's a global problem. In America, in the 30s, uh, during the Great Crisis, they introduced the social security system. People only lived for one year after retirement in that system. Now they live with the benefits of the system for tens of years. And it's a problem in America, and it will be a problem in Europe. Professor, thank you very much. One, one English question. Thank you, Professor. Since you talked about this or business, so I have a question that the change in this share by different region is due to shift in business from manufacturing to service or software, or due to the region as a brand or the country as a brand. Because when we see USA, so we have a lot of brands like uh, Google, Amazon, so they are going to different countries. So USA is not just making good software, but they are branding them so well. So what do you think is most important? Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good question. And it's a combination of those factors. But the emphasis on the value of the brand is one that I would like to focus on because uh, you mentioned it, and I think it is important that uh, it's, uh, to put it in economic terms, it's the uh, value of what you produce or what we produce that's important, not just what we physically produce, right? And so it's the value of the marginal product or the value of the total product. And, and branding is important because it increases the value. One can sell at a higher price, whether it's real difference in quality or whether it's perceived difference in quality, in the end it doesn't matter so long as one can indeed sell it at a higher price. Uh, so the value of the brand, and that's where I think research at business schools is very important, and I was stressing the fact that uh, in well-functioning systems, the pure economics uh, 
department or faculty, the business school, the school of public policy, all work together and enrich each other. And this is, I think, one very good example of uh, that uh, it makes a big difference. And I think, uh, you know, speaking about the situation of the Czech Republic and the countries in Central Eastern Europe, I think one issue that is here is that one still doesn't get as much revenue from what's produced as one could with good marketing, branding, you know, uh, et cetera. So yeah, very good point. Tak. Thank you for your answers. Thank you for your questions, but time flies and we can move our discussion to the lobby for the coffee break. So it will take about half an hour and we continue with our panel discussion here in this room. Thank you.
Doufám, že jste si vychutnali naše růžové kafe. Že jste I hope you enjoyed our pink fake and Now going to have a time to come and rare and this I seen is the real shots a pack of rare social apple. Good morning. Art and tears you come you at the celebrations of the 30 30th anniversary of the Faculty of Economics and Administration. We are, we keep on saying 30 years. I would like to follow up on my private discussion with the Dean. 30 years in the university environment is a pretty short time. Silva, how you're 30 years old, so is it a long time? It is, it is a long time because it was 30 years ago that the production of my favorite car, the Trabant, was terminated. We were taking this car to visit our grandma's place. Yeah, it is a historical car. So let's, let's be more serious and say that in year 91, when the faculty was established, the war in the Persian Gulf was declared and and the inflation in the Czech Republic was over 50 percent. Inflation has been a frequent term recently and I have an, an association and a memory of goods. In the year 91 we were on a trip with my family to the opening ceremony of the first supermarket in the Czech Republic. Oh, Aleš, it's, it's a long time, it's a long time, it's really the past, but let's go back to the future, to the present, and welcome our speakers. The first one is Dana Kovaříková, the head of the European Commission representation in the Czech Republic. And then Jaroslava Rezliová, the CEO of Manpower Group. Igor Mesinsky, a partner Jan Schweinar, an economist and co-founder of CGRE and Marek Třeška, the executive of Hartmann Rico. The following discussion, the subsequent discussion, is going to be about topics we are interested in. We have, we are 30 years old and we want to know what happens in the next 30 years? What are the new challenges? What will the faculty look like? That is something I actually mentioned at the beginning. I believe that these are the questions we, that will be answered in more detail also by the painter Petr Mores. I'm really curious what is coming out of this. So, how is the discussion going to look like? You are going to ask, and I'm going to ask, but also I hope the audience is going to ask, not only in the hall, but also through the Slido app. So, I kindly ask you to use our Wi-Fi connection and go to Slido and enter the numeric code you can see on the board and I'm going to watch the tablet and read your questions and ask the questions. And of course, you will get the opportunity to ask live. Just please wait for the microphone so that those who are watching us on the stream don't miss anything. Thank you. You mentioned Slido. The last important thing interesting thing from the year 91. The first website was launched, so we would not have this conference here or online without the year 1991. And also encourage our guests from foreign countries to ask their questions in English. Thank you very much.
So let's start. 30 years into the past, the present, and 30 years into the future. My question is for you, Mrs. Reslerová. What do you think, how are the requirements for the graduates going to change, and how will that affect the teaching, and what are the challenges for the teachers? Thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm representing an HR agency, and we are a world company that is investing in research and surveys, and we are asking about the trends, the upcoming trends on the labor market. What is going to happen? We were asking employers, employees, and some partners, such as the World Labour Organization and the world of labor is not only going to change in the next 30 years, but it has already changed. We are just not saying it aloud, and it's no topics for the politicians. But the new labor market, it's here. It's now in one of our surveys. It's called the revolution of skills. And every two years, we are looking at the future of the labor market. And we were trying to find out what will the professions of the near future look like. And we identified about 200 new positions, jobs, we cannot even well name today and understand. But for the Z generation that will enter the labor market in masses, it will be a standard part of their job. 67% and better cooperation between science and practice, which is lagging behind in the Czech Republic. So I believe that brand whole new needs will arise so the need for education will change. So yes, this is a revolutionary thing, right? So let's evolve let's the market. And I would like to ask, what will the labor market look like in terms of mergers and acquisitions, and what services will be offered by KPNG? You mean in 30 years? Well, this is hard to answer. Let me say my personal experience. I graduated from the university in the year 1990. I studied economics in Prague at the Faculty of Economics. And I went through such courses as political economy, socialism, capitalism, and then I started working for a bank. And what I was missing a lot were soft skills, presentation skills. I feel like they don't really teach it, even these days at the universities. And when I compare it with my kids, who are attending a great school, they have, from the very first class, they have presentation skills. It's a presentation, and every year also the English part of the presentation is getting longer. And this is extremely important for the future labor market, because expert skills do matter, yes, but combined with psychology, sociology, the person must be ready for changing the job several times during the life. And these social soft skills help a lot. We will probably stay auditors and tax consultants because the legislation will be more and more complicated. We will be advising on mergers and acquisitions. But the flexibility of graduates will be extremely important. You said this is going to change. How are the services going to change? What does Industry 4.0 bring and the development of AI bring? What is your role in this? Automation. Automation in consultancy. In things we could not imagine 
before legal drafts of con contract drafts are prepared by machines these days. The automation of reports is amazing. It's, it's huge money we are investing every year in the simplification and automation as entrepreneurs are facing a lacking people. Also, our organization needs to hire between 100 and 120 people and it's hard to find them and they are more and more expensive. So the automation, that's a big change. It has been going on for several years already. Is this one of the future's jobs? Well, in all industries, automation will replace certain types of jobs. They will vanish. We, we talk with trade unions, we talk on the European level, and this is a situation where there are concerns that when we have automated massively production, that a lot of people will lose their jobs because robots will be doing the jobs. But actually, from what we have measured and counted, well, it's not us, you know, we are, we are a labor market expert and we are contracting out these researches to experts. So we counted that 10 jobs that vanish will be replaced by four specialists because these people will be setting the machines, programming the machines, coding and repairing. So it's not like, it's not a massive drop in employment. And like we said at the beginning, it's, there is going to be a huge transformation and shift in jobs, a technological shift. And it is already here now. We just don't talk about it so much. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned cooperation between science and research. I saw Mr. Křiško nodding. So what would the cooperation between universities and businesses look like? Well, this is a good question. I was nodding but not disagree, not agreeing. But that was when you said that some jobs will vanish. I don't think this. Like we have certain specialists fixing old things. They will stay here to a smaller extent. I feel I'm a representative of, of the real industry and real economy. And we have to make decisions if we want to develop something something ourselves or if we want to acquire it as a compact entity like an m a this is always about decision making how fast the product or service is needed for us do we want to be the first or are we just catching up with the market so this is what we base our decisions on i hope i'm i answered your question Okay, my next question would be for Mrs. Kovařikova. I saw we talked about digitalization and automation. So how do we stand? What is needed for the upcoming years? What needs to be improved? Thank you for the invitation and for the question. Yeah, I was nodding because the fact that automation and robotization are processes that are going on. We can support it with figures. There McKenzie estimates that in the Czech Republic up to 51% of jobs will disappear because we have a high share of processing industries and there's a lot of task, routine tasks. Typically in the car industry, it's robots that are making cars and PricewaterCoopers estimate it's going to be 40% of jobs. So these processes are underway, but it's also a huge opportunity to start with a new technology and produce things with a high added value. As for digitalization, this is something 
where the Czech Republic, at least according to the numbers of the European Commission, here the Czech Republic stands pretty well in the digitalization of industrial processes, but the use as ad of advanced technologies is that's worse. Big data, AI, cloud computing. And another thing where we are behind Europe is the involvement of in ICT, especially of women. I think in the Czech Republic it's only 1% of women working. This is, of course, not only a Czech thing, but while in Europe, the average in ICT, there is four times more men. In the Czech Republic, it's six times more men. So this is a big opportunity for universities. I would like to say something inspiring for the labor market. I believe that the labor market will be very dynamic in the upcoming years, and there are jobs we don't even know about yet that they will exist. Like 15 years ago, we didn't know there would be a social media administrator or influencer. So the labor market and the education will be about constant learning and there are some theories I agree with that universities in the future will have more students in the lifelong education and it will be about flexibility and willingness to to learn new things talking about education mr. Schweiner how about the current programs will there be more inter faculty competencies needed I think it's going to be a combination of both. The, the cooperation is essential and it will evolve and it will also go, it will cross industries. And then there'll be a narrow specialization to reach the top level, the excellence. The person will have to be a real expert and this lifelong education will be important, yes. And there is a big opportunity for universities because where it works well, the past past alumni, graduates, they're used to coming back and taking courses and, and there is a seminar for them or a lecture. So this is going on and it will be going on even more. And we said that some people fear that the pace of the technological progress will lead to high unemployment. I don't think these fears are justified. Yes, robots will replace people, that's true, but we have been collecting statistics over a hundred years, and the unemployment is not growing, it is fluctuating, but it's not declining. Employment is not declining. There are new jobs popping up, and it's important to adapt and have the qualification and the schools who, who understood this are now teaching the students new solutions, ways to find a solution, and they are educating them to ensure they will be on the orbit they need to be, and they will have high salaries. It is, it's, it's easier to be a good entrepreneur when salaries are low, but it's, it's challenging to be a good entrepreneur when salaries are high. Um, we have a question and this, which says education and not only university education should prepare people for work in an automated world. Which skills will be essential? Can you tell us, you teachers, what shall we teach? What are you going to ask the graduates from? We can take it one by one. Well, I would like to follow up. We said that 50% of jobs will vanish or 40% will vanish. But when we look at the jobs we had 150 years ago, it would be the same thing. The share would be the same, just, just the development has been quicker and we said the first website was launched 30 years ago. The world has been accelerating and we don't need to be afraid, we just have to be ready for changes and flexible. This is essential.
And what we expect from graduates is that after graduation, they will not come to a job interview untouched by practice. This is the key to success. The graduate must, at least during the last two years, they must work and meet real life and not come to the not take the job just for money, but be actively interested in the work and be interested in applying his or her skills. These are the best graduates and this is the potential top in the team. Still, we are lucky because 50% of our graduates in the fifth year already work and they are choosing their employer pretty early already during their, their bachelor studies. Can you be more specific about what shall be taught at the faculty? Well, this is a big topic. We are a big employer in the Czech Republic. We are providing employees to companies, if I put it this way. On average, we, we, we recruit about 1,500 people per month. We are really big and we see a big shift in the requirements of employers for future employees. It's, it's less about fixed hard skills and it's more about competencies. There is emphasis on soft skills and I think that universities are well placed to, to develop soft skills. It should be a discussion forum. It should be analysis. It should be about conclusions and critical thinking, presentation skills, the right way of communication. And these are the key skills and we have heard it from many colleagues. This is this is what is needed in the companies and this is connected with practice because these days we want students. We want students to come at least to take a, a side job or a summer job. We want to show them the real real work, how things work because it, it is enriching for them. And one last thing, in one of the surveys I was talking about, in 43 countries we were asking 25,000 employers, we were asking about these requirements, future requirements, and it appears that besides what we have said, they are also expecting resilience, independence, and the ability to learn new things constantly. It has been said many times, I can only confirm it, that lifelong education and adding new skills along with the technological development, that will be the precondition for, for getting a new job. Mrs. Kovaříková was nodding. Well, would you like to say that we are heading for a fight for a microphone? These are because these are very important topics for all of us. So I would like to uh, compliment on the colleagues regarding the skills. Uh, Czech Republic will be affected by robotization and digitalization, and digital skills are necessary to be taught. The European Commission uh, announced a very ambitious target, so about 80% of the grown-up population should be aware of mastering at least the basic digital skills. But regarding employment, a more in-depth knowledge is necessary. So digitalization of universities, um, educational programs about digitalization, uh, education in English, that's 
important. And I work for an international organization, so I would like to emphasize that the uh, international uh, knowledge and international experience is something that's very needed, not only English, but also other languages, French and other languages, that's the important knowledge. Mr. Treshka would like to answer, and I would like to ample the, the question. So if you employ our graduates, what do you think they're good at and what should they learn? Uh, we are very satisfied with them. If they chose us, we choose them. Uh, we make mistakes in this very uh, little, not very commonly. And I would like to think that the professions will not be um, erased by digitalization, but uh, they will be redefined. Uh, for a, instance, a profession of a marketeer it will be different and is different now from what it used to be 15 years ago and will be different in the future. And all those functions will be uh, replaced and, and um, renewed by robotization, digitalization, and many tasks in companies will be more and more complex and more difficult to understand, to grasp. So our employee should uh, understand the matter as such into big detail, and they should be able to explain this complex matter to their environment in a way so that they could collaborate efficiently. Uh, for instance, like Mr. Grigar explains astrophysics, uh, which is very complex, uh, there are, or the way Mr. Schweiner, how he explains economics, there is an amount of uh, domains that are very, very complex, but the added value to these will be the human interaction, and we're back to soft skills. You cannot divide that. We need experts in something. We need experts in topics, and we need them to interact with their corporate environment, not only the IQ, but also the EQ. So we spoke about the capacity to learn, and not only ca the capacity, the willingness to learn, which is not equal. Those are not two same things. When I ended up the school in 1998, the rule was you and the school go to job and you spend your whole life there. But I think the development is going to be very different and I'm not sure whether it's going to take place in companies or universities. I suppose it should be in some matter of cooperation. I see the world in images, how it is permeable, how the world is permeable in virtual reality and more open. And I think the universities and your faculty should be open and permeable for everyone because those are the new things for the students to learn, the exchange of ideas, exchange of experience. Mr. Schweiner talked about it uh, at the beginning. The uh, permeability is achievable through virtualization. It is a big topic. It is, uh, it is easier in the area of services. Um, the worker cannot work online from home um, remotely. But after what we've experienced through the pandemic, they, uh, the employees do not want to get back to their offices 
for eight hours, five days a week. They want more flexibility. They want to manage the work time, the leisure time, the family time. Uh, flexibility is something very positive about the pandemic, and it opened the possibilities of the virtual world, and we would like to stay in that world also at work and in schools. We are very glad to hear that because we stay in the the online world partly. So how about the willingness to learn? I, I like to experience the willingness face to face, not online, but there is a whole set of questions that we evaluate in uh, the interviews with our candidates. We have routineers and we need them at, at our company. So it will, not everything will super dynamic, super creative. There are industries uh, in the electronic world. Uh, if you go uh, for a one-month holiday, you get back and everything is different. In medicine, it's different, but the willingness to learn is still there. Uh, but you cannot work uh, le on learning the soft skills. You can deepen them, elaborate them, but twice a year at the university, you have credits, and exams, and I believe that the student will need some feedback, will be which uh, will be gradual, not just twice a year. Uh, the feedback should come constantly from professors, from classmates, and you uh, will learn using that. If we talk about the organization of the university studies, there is one opinion I follow. Uh, many students leave universities after their bachelor degree and do not cont uh, continue to do the master. And the bachelor studies should be more ample, uh, covering soft skills, covering digitization, and the profiling should come later in the MA studies. I absolutely agree. Uh, all these currents should be more intensive. In business schools in America, we test students uh, how they are doing from the very beginning. So after the first week at the university, uh, they get an automatic quiz and they see whether they got 50%, 100% and they have instant feedback. So they are forced to study. It is a sort of uh, secondary school college drill, but it's very efficient and the interlacing with the companies that's very well prepared and works very well. KPMG General Electric cohabitate with the schools and schools send out teams of students overseas to countries where they help to solve problems. So the practice is integrated in the training and the education is so important in the matter where the basics of the knowledge, uh, statistics, languages, this is what the companies expect, but everything else is integrated in that basic knowledge. And when the student leaves the school, the employer knows that he covers all the areas, financing, accounting, and everything is contained and maybe the student is uh, specialized in finances. Uh, he's especially strong, or she is, but uh, they are capable of solving problems and they are used 
to the pressure of constantly functioning, constantly being aware. And this is the way the world functions. This is the way, not just twice a year and exams. Exams are all the time. So how uh, do we stand as the Faculty of Economics and Administration uh, abroad? This is up to you to respond. But I believe that you founded this faculty. Well, Charles University didn't found such faculty. And this is the difference between two top universities in the country and reflects your being innovative, being willing to solve the problems that you see as acute and you're not bound with uh, rigid history. And I believe that it is important that you continue doing what you can do and observing the others. In American universities, we observe each other and we adopt everything. Someone else starts. If it works, uh, we continue. If it doesn't, we drop it and they'll drop it too. So we compete for students. It's m the most competitive environment in the world. Uh, we all compete. There are thousands of us and the competition among the best 20 is immensely hard and that makes us very actionable, very active. I'll move your attention to this chart, to this table. So how do you perceive this? How does it, uh, how does it grow? It is a very interesting discussion, very nice to embody visually. It looks very nice, so I am looking forward to seeing it at the end. So now the time has come for the questions from the auditorium. Hello, thank you for this great panel. I am a professor in the United States, and I'm here for, for a year. And so one of the things that I've noticed in this conversation is how similar the conversations we have in the US, specifically around, I heard communication skills. I heard um, concerns about complexity and being able to be a good systems thinker. And so I wanted to say, one, that I think these are the things that we're thinking about um, globally. Um, these are the same skills. And the other thing is challenging faculty to think about what does this mean for educating in the classroom. So for one of some of the things that we think about is how are we bringing practitioners into the classroom? How are we ensuring that students are having those experiences of being able to communicate, being able to build those social social kind of skills? Um, so I would like to ask you, like, what are the types of things, whether it's being, you know, having students engage with practitioners, professionals in this sector, how, how, what are kind of some innovations that faculty could um, incorporate in the classroom? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Treshka. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I guess... Uh, the point is, uh, in my opinion, you, you said challenging the faculty, and I think this is the right uh, connection. Uh, in my opinion, uh, many universities, maybe including uh, this uh, Masaryk University, work with, we call it lagging indicators, uh, kind of uh, rankings uh, or, or um, satisfaction surveys of past students, of, of recent students. However, I somehow miss leading indicators, indicators oriented into the future. And uh, uh, one of those, it may be what Professor Schweiner just mentioned, that uh, competing between the universities, maybe just with the hope that something will work. On the other hand, I, I also 
uh, graduated in Germany, and uh, one of their leading indicators was exactly what you mentioned. This was the number of practitioners within the uh, applicated uh, uh, staff, so to speak. So not in uh, economics, uh, but in the, in the applicated uh, sciences, whereas not only the students, but also the professors uh, had to submit the, their practice, either consultancy practice, or I would say the real practice, otherwise they wouldn't be allowed to teach. So this is the challenging the faculty, yes. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So the next question. Hello, I would like to ask Professor Schweiner or the other panelists. It's the. It's my topic. Is is the. We said that ten jobs will disappear, but four will pop up, but they will be more challenging, more specialized, and you said that the potential of all kids should be developed and this is what the Czech schools are not so good at so they are just reproducing the, the things as they did with the parents so developing everyone is everyone's potential is important and but there is a capacity every person has a capacity and in a knowledge economy we cannot expect that everyone will handle cover all these new professions of course they may replace the old ones but require very high skills so the citizens salary is the question what's your opinion about this what do you mean with citizen salary ah you mean the, the guaranteed basic income okay well we talked about the social European model and there I believe it is important that there is a bottom limit what the society guarantees. I don't think it makes sense that also rich people get the basic income. Billionaires don't need it. It makes no economic sense. It's a waste of resources that can be spent elsewhere. So the optimum system would be that, that there is a difference in income and those who work but have lower income, like in McDonald's, they can get this social benefit, this salary to be able to survive. And at a certain point, the subsidy changes into a tax and it's a positive tax for the high-income individuals and it's a subsidy for the low-income individuals. And then the market will show us what is needed. So if high salaries, if there are high salaries, there is more tax collected and it has been proven all over the world. You say that not everybody can break through this ceiling I think it is important that the system is flexible and those who sort of mature later, they get the opportunity again to participate. This community colleges system in the US is important. You have a young person who is 16, 17, simply not mature for a good university, but two years later, he or she is. And the system makes it possible to change from the local college to this top university. And then, of course, there will be opportunities for people who, for whatever reason, don't go that high. But the economy needs people on all levels, even though there is a shift towards the human capital and high added value. But for instance, in the car makers, the car makers in the south of the US, there is Mexican people working who can't read and write. They make a drawing for them, what needs to be assembled, and together with rob of course the robot needs assistance, and the labor force is not qualified, but there is a high added value. So the society will be stratified. There will be different opportunities 
But of course, there will be more opportunities for people with high skills and education. And that's why we must invest in human capital, because also from the social point of view, educated people c commit less crime, are healthier. So, but there will also be opportunities on these, on the other levels. So, even though there will be, be this differentiation, the employment will stay high, and it's not going to be a trend. It's fluctuating, and the these social measures, the desired measures, need to be continued. Um, we talked about the need of cooperation between companies and schools. I'm so happy I can see the representatives of companies from mergers and acquisitions and outsourcing. So, Mr. Mesensky, what's the situation with global talents? People, do people have to move because of their job? Do they need to control different parts of businesses in different parts of the world? I, I have heard that there is a lack of them. What do you think? There is always a shortage of talented people, and there will always be. What has changed during the last one and a half years is the need to travel. This need has subsided, and I don't think we are going to reach the pre-pandemic level. We, even in international teams, when we are working on a big merger or acquisition, the foreign colleagues just join us online and they don't need to travel. Last year, we had an interesting experience. We were selling one company here in Brno, and the buyer did not even pop up, and, and only their, their lawyer signed the contract based on a power of attorney. So I think the need for traveling will go down, and many things can be efficiently handled online. The problem is that we are hiring about 100 people per day, and these fresh brains have nobody to learn from. And it's a huge loss for them when they have just graduated. It's a loss of time if they are just at home, on home office. Whenever it was possible, we went and had a beer because they saw some colleagues live for the first time after six months. So digitalization is great, but of course there are human barriers and they reduce the effectiveness you really hire so many people because of your growth. Not everybody is able to stay in our company. Let me put it this way. We are an attractive employer. Between consultancies, we have been number one in the Czech Republic or among the top ten. But we are an employer who offers a lot but requires a lot. And I think this is okay for skilled people who want to achieve something. They have great opportunities. Not everybody can withstand this and want to continue or there is an inner, not everybody has this inner engine. But another thing, you we talked about how the graduates are changing for the future. But as the graduates are changing, the employers are changing. It's a mirror. We had a big discussion yesterday where we said that we are not going to approve home office to our employees. They just stay at home. They don't need to ask for a permission. And it's just one of the things. This reflects the demand of the graduates. Today's generation is different. They, they have different needs, and if it's if you want to be attractive for them, you need to reflect this. And this is a trend that will continue and will be important. I'm happy you're saying this, 
because at, at first the requirements appear to be horrible. You said that we need to teach the students to present things, have soft skills, be resilient, take on feedback. I, I admit it's, it may bring, it may raise fears among people. Mrs. Rezlerova and Mr. Treshka. Well, let me add one thing regarding the home office and online and international mobility. We tend to reduce the organizations, a corporation or a public authority or a non-profit organization. This is a machine and we are instructing it, read, do, but we work with humans and one of the things that is constantly needed is the feedback and that leads to inspiration inspiring people please give me a feedback if you're listening to me give me a feedback how many of you have found inspiration in teams or on skype one okay this is exactly what i think so we talk about different formats of cooperation and we talk about inspiration and talents. It's hard to teach, it's hard to learn, it can be tried and tested, but for that you need interaction, interactive teaching, not just this frontal teaching. We need an environment where students learn from experts, from practice. And one more thing I have realized during the last 18 months, the personal contact in the office and teamwork and teaching things from one another, events, having a beer, going for a weekend. I, I don't like calling it team building, I call it a beer and a bike trip instead but you're building loyalty, loyalty to the brand, to the company. You don't, you can't do that through MS Teams. It doesn't work and it has an impact on the labor market because if the person is loyal only thanks to the benefits and thanks to the salary, to the pay, and there's nothing else, then it's hard to retain these people and inspire them. So the personal contact is extremely important for me and for the fresh for the fresh graduates it is of key importance uh, i can only repeat what has been said and what i agree with it depends on how the employers compile or prepare the hybrid labor models it depends on the domain on the industry we have seen a big trend especially in services in the service sector, even for a mid-sized company, they have been changing their work environment. They are moving to smaller offices, they are renting the bigger offices, and they have less chairs, and they, they, even, they hire consultancies and architects, and they are now new specialists workplace effectivity specialists and they are creating pleasant hubs and cafes places to meet it's not necessarily a work chair and we have seen this across the country because the, we have a lot of we have a lot of clients we know intimately and we have seen that people want to come to work to meet colleagues and to have a coffee with them and to talk in the corridor and there's a lot of details and small conflicts these this is done during the break it's not done in the official environment of the meeting and that's something you cannot achieve in teams and we have seen it Companies have been moving, they have been on the move. We are providing also simple one-off consultancy and that there is a huge, this is a big trend at the moment and it's of course 
the implication of COVID and all the things we have seen recently. So in the practice, there are uh, several applications for graduates, but where's the place for the uh, graduates of the economics uh, faculty graduates uh, in medicine, in sciences, you can see uh, uh, collaboration on case studies, on realistic uh, stuff. So, but what can a teacher do more for students in a real world? Students who come, us fr come to us from this faculty, in my eyes, uh, they are very skilled in the digital skills, but there are uh, domains in B2C, in e-commerce, direct contact with the customer, and we as a client would welcome uh, the graduates to come to us uh, already elaborate, uh, already complete, skilled. Uh, so this this might be my suggestion. We are trying to initiate new domains at universities. My colleagues uh, do MBA course at, in data analytics and there we at the, the University of Economics in Prague, uh, we already uh, train our future employees. So we are trying to support the club of investors, for instance, that is interested in capital markets, fusions, acquisitions, and we are trying to present the company there and talk to the students because when the students profile themselves already at the universities, those are the golden eggs that we are searching for. There's no need to talk about the application of or use of economists in uh, public administration. So they can uh, use their skills in international institutions. Oh, I would like to read a, a question from Slido. So in 30 years, will we be still working in the place of our residence? It depends on where we reside. That's also an answer. Um, that will be up to the development of industries, but also the development of mobility, whether in 30 years uh, we will have a complete, in 30 years, uh, an almost entire highway network and there will be high-speed trains so there will be a big permeability between regions and cities but digitalization will help home office working uh, I think we will work much more from home than now I, I do not mean the quarantine now but there, there will be people who will want to strictly differentiate and and will take it as a added value. I think that we will work more from home and the home will be everywhere, everywhere. And a lot of that will be allowed by a lot of segments, certainly not uh, industrial production, agriculture and so on. But if I look at our statistics in 2027, 
We expect to uh, have many more jobs appear uh, in the social services. There will be more with the uh, aging population and there will be a demand for these jobs. So there will be people who will come to someone, help someone with uh, things. Uh, and we can see this already in the Western um, civilization where the population is even older. So the type of work will be changing. But I believe that we will not work five days a week, eight hours a day, the working hours will be shortened. It could have happened already a long time ago. We still need more leisure time to learn new things, to recuperate, but to learn, to learn about the world that is changing much faster during the human life, much more than it used to change before. I would like to ask the Dean if we can shorten the working hours. I think this last point is very important, but it will depend very much on the culture in the sector, because where you work with workaholics, uh, it would be difficult for one company, KPMG, for instance, to divide itself from others and have 30 hours working week, so everybody would hate them. But if, if everyone transfers to a shorter working week, um, there will certainly be differentiation according to different domains, different industries. Digitization will enable people to live uh, remotely come to work by high-speed trains and in our Czech context it will be more important because we are a compact country. So if we have high-speed trains and uh, highways we have two permeable regions where people can live in the country, work in the city or vice versa. Uh, the question will be what the companies will require from their employees. When we talked about Europe, America, China, one interesting fact, it seems that the European banks that are trying to catch up with the efficiency of the American banks, uh, who say everybody back to work because banking is like apprentice uh, education. We cannot teach the uh, new bankers uh, long distance remotely. But the, uh, if, if the scissors open more and the American banks start to dominate, that depends whether uh, every all the banks will uh, go in the same direction. Probably the big influence will also dwell in transfer speed, digital tr uh, speed. So 6G should become reality in uh, the 30s. So uh, we will meet at the, uh, in 3D in companies uh, doctors can meet patients in 3D. So uh, in industries, they may use 3D gloves or whatever. So they, we, can, we can project the beach to uh, work when we sit at home or in the office. So back to the trends. What will disappear? What will evolve? Uh, the enriching factor of the society that will influence the well-being, entertainment. Those segments will develop further on 
And one of the sectors where I can see that we will we will use in the future is the public discussion. Uh, COVID taught us to remove our public domains as an institution that should stimulate the European debate. We went online and the public is multiplied. If you have a speaker from abroad, he won't come here or cancels at the last moment. When it's online, he just switches on. So this will be used much more. I will continue uh, with the COVID topic, what it has taught us, uh, how should public administration work. COVID um, demasked what doesn't work in public administration. What m must we learn for the future? What must we do? The pandemic of COVID is a non-presidential uh, thing that generations before us has not experienced. So the need for digitization uh, has appeared and the digitization of processes, digital skills, uh, um, there has been a significant move, uh, creation of the banking identity. But uh, Czech Republic, we are lagging behind the European average. But what else has it taught us? It has taught us about the strength of information and disinformation. I'm opening a different topic now, but it has taught us about the necessity uh, of resilience as the uh, society, the necessities of further medical research. During the pandemic in the Czech Republic, uh, it has shown how big role is played by scientific institutes and uh, medical or uh, scientific institutions which uh, substituted some roles of the state, in fact. So if I get back to the universities, for the universities, it is a possibility to show how big player on the market they are, not in, not only in the uh, educational field, but as a player in the public space, in the society. So we have some questions from the audience, and one question is probably for me. Hello, is the, is the faculty considering education for people aged 45 and more? Yes, it is, and it is already doing it as part of a lifelong education. Um, thank you for a great conference. I'm happy you like it. And there's another question. 30 years is a long time. What is the realistically longest time horizon you are working with? In, when talking about a job, you said not everyone can make it in our company. When I was in one organization, they said that people stay on average one year. So what is the time horizon you are working with regarding fluctuation and jobs? Well, work with. I know my ultimate date when I'm going to finish. But we have a career plan for every graduate. It is a standard plan and every graduate or employee knows that when, when they work as expected, they will be rising on the ladder. And in a few years, they may be in this position or in that position. Not everybody can handle this, but we want the, the graduates to 
to stay at least four to five years before they become a manager. But it's been harder and harder to retain people. And I've been in the industry for 25 years. And this is my fourth employer. So the interval of change, of change of a job or of an industry, it's getting shorter. I must agree, in our company, we employ about 350 people, so we're not that huge. It's three to four years in a standard consulting position. And also our clients have the experience that the millennials, the young generation, those who are still studying or already working, they need more than a career growth. They want challenging, interesting projects, and the em employers who can offer something more or something else have been more successful in retaining this, these people. Of course, this cannot be done in every company, but nobody can do the same job for a long time. In the statistics, we can see that in the 80s, the average duration was 15 years. In the 90s, it went down and now people change their jobs five times during their life and this is going to double during the next three to five years so it can be ten jobs during one's life if not more and even across industries and we are back at what we talked about it's about the willingness to get a new qualification to learn new things and I don't think that the state policy is really focused on these things, especially now with the government as we have it. They're trying to control it centrally. I saw the Labour Minister Deputy and they said they have about 3.5 billion crowns for education and they will distribute it through Labour offices. But I think they should give it to universities and employers because they know best what to do. But especially in the political public domain, the, there's no debate about education, about the labor market, about the needs for qualification. And it's a pity because this would help us so much. But nobody actually grasped this topic. Mr. Schweinar would like to respond. Let me say one thing. It's about Minster and the human capital. We talked about the statistics and Bernal. We can see that we need to distinguish between stock, where the number of employees is not really changing, but what matters is that the flows, the inflow and the outflow may be substantial. So it appears that we have stability, but actually we don't, because people are circulating. And another thing which, which the theory foresees is that at the beginning of a career, people are changing a lot and then they are changing less. And the reason is that they are looking for the right match between the employee and the employer. It takes a while, but when found, they stay together for a long time. The modern technologies are, of course, causing a higher fluctuation, but there is this trend and it will probably continue. Mr. Mesensky, I think that this interval also gets longer because of the mortgage and kids. Of course, we, we like employees with a mortgage and with kids because they are more stable. This is definitely related. My experience is that if you want to get profound basis in the industry you should spend at least four years there and then look around if there is an opportunity you can get a new position you can gain new experience but changing after one year it makes no sense to me unless there are some human some problems with the human relations but you should be serious about your job and not change so quickly the audience hasn't asked a question for a long time. 
Does anybody want to ask a question? This is a question for everybody because we have employers here. You, you criticized things in the Czech Republic that there is a lack of cooperation between businesses and universities where it's a routine practice in the USA. Employers are coming to the university, assigning projects and enriching one another and new high-tech companies are arising and that we can we can see here somehow that we cannot actually meet well but we we don't think that the problem is just on the side of universities but also employers so why can't we do that when it is possible elsewhere i don't know it's not just a lack of will on one side Maybe it is not supported by any standard programs and schemes. I can't really explain this. Well, in my opinion, we are part of, of the German system, of the German group, and we are spoiled. In Germany, they have this Auszubis, Auszubildende. That means that a secondary school pupil needs to take, to do practical things and needs to have results. And even though they must or they have to, they like doing it. And this makes the system special. And I must admit that we are also coming to universities, but more students are and talents are coming to us. So we don't have a big deficit because we find our people eventually we can think that we are missing out on a talent, on talent, but our lead times are something like 60 days. So it could work better, but it's, I'm not really totally frustrated. Any more questions from the audience? So, Mr. Schweinar, I, I get the point. In the system, when I take the American system, which works well, there is this interconnection somehow given. It's organic because the, the graduates go back to the university and say, we need these three students for this type of a job for the summer and three students for that type of a job. and they are also doing executive MBA and weekend MBA. There is a natural flow. The dean invites them for a coffee and GM could work well in this. So it's a circle, it's an organic circle. It can be accelerated or slowed down. We need more students. The, s the, the dean says, okay, so let's Let's give you more students. So the system needs to be established. And then it's rolling. And when you think that it is a good school, you get back to it to hire people and you recommend them. It is something that is set up. But of course, it's not like weed. It is like a plant you need to take care about or take care of. but. As long as you do it, it works well. I have a couple of questions, and one is for you, or maybe for everyone. There are several similar questions. Should the Faculty of Economics be focused on basic research or application and, and cooperation with practice? So it's our size of Phoenix state. We should do both, but the author says, will energy be missing when writing articles and, and planning projects? Well, in my experience, it really depends on the resources the school has. 
it is excellent when the professions do basic research and applied research. It is interconnected because the empirical research is the application and you work with businesses, with corporate data, and this is the circle I was talking about. And the alumni contribute because they want their diploma to be from the best school still. So it's an ongoing process. And so as long as possible, there should be both types of research, which is excellent for the students because they're getting the latest information firsthand. It's not that the professor has been lecturing the same thing for tens, for decades. So, but now there is research, it works like this, the students are involved and the students do the research among businesses or in families, wherever. So it is, it is hard to define ahead and it depends on the instruments the school can generate from the state or from public resources. And then of course we have the tuition fees that is something what has been discussed in Europe and here tuition fees yes or no or postponed should the student pay it back then from the salary which they have thanks to the human capital they get so let them pay it later when they are rich they don't need to pay it right away and these are associated questions and as long as it works well we can see that the top universities have managed to combine this very well Does someone from the audience want to react? So, uh, some more from Slido. An interesting question. Are the Generation Z Europeans more lazy than those in America and Asia? Generation Z, the, the generation that grew up uh, tied together with the virtual environment, the generation is not lazy and they have very clear values with which they enter into the labor market, into the active uh, working life. But it will depend a lot how m on how much the employers share those values in uh, life. It is not about just the salary, but what the work represents for the young people. It is a generation that will look for their place in the world, but it's a generation that knows that how their parents live in uh, relative comfort need not necessarily be repeated, so they are more sensitive to environment issues and the massive influx of this generation into the labor market will mean a massive shift in the values and the situation in the companies. I would like to ask colleagues from the practical world to what extent uh, are you going to adapt to this generation or how much will you force it to uh, for, force them to adapt to that traditional uh, life? Well, I have mentioned it, we are adapting. We are adjusting, but I do fear that still it is normal to go to work, not to work from home. But the uh, question is resolved for once. The share of work from home will grow and we as KPMG will never need a bigger house, office building. Uh, than what we've got in Prague, because even though we have twice as many employees, we will all fit in. And the Generation Z has different values from those that we had 30 years ago. When I ended 
the university 30 years ago. But they have a different perspective than from what I had in 1990. Uh, uh, I ended in 1990, and very soon I became a director of a branch and direct, director of the sector. So the movement will never be as fast as it used to be. The generation has the outlook that some things will last longer in their lives. The change is here. Uh, and one thing is the way we look at them and the way they look at us. Where can they be in five years? Uh, that's different. It will certainly influence uh, one pole will affect the other. I do not want to bagatellize Generation Z, but uh, it affects all of our life, uh, our businesses, uh, our work, and it's very in inspiring and usable for other generation than other generations than that Generation Z. They are impatient, but they have um, the possibility to uh, use their energy. It might be better if they uh, get their first wounds somewhere else and come experienced to us. But I must say that I'm more tolerant. I, I'm not um, shocked by seeing someone else uh, seated on a table barefooted. Uh, we we uh, do not adapt that much, but you're not in the office always. I wanted to say what I see from my sector. I see young people more educated, more language skilled, with bigger capacity to formulate or to uh, the possibility of critical thinking, something that we were approaching uh, in a difficult way. So it has become automatic filter for the uh, uh, admission of new employees, those who were not abroad at Erasmus or s somewhere else, uh, they have no chance. And it's good because there should be the ALMA program for young people, for young employees. So anybody who wants to get some experience, short-term experience abroad should be supported from the means of the European Union, and it's a good trend. Those were beautiful words to close this panel with. So let's take a look at what expects us in 30 years. What can we see on the table of the future? So there is still some space to fill in. We can still direct it in the direction, in the way where we want to. We still need some open space. So our time is up, and I would like to ask the dean and the sub-dean to thank our speakers and say goodbye to I was listening with my eyes and ears open because this was a great panel discussion, exceptional one. I, I wanted to close the faculty for a moment and reopen it again. Uh, suddenly then I felt that uh, it's great we're doing it the right way. The truth is somewhere in between. But uh, I would like to thank you for inspiring comments questions and answers and the willingness to share with us the visions of your employees, your experience, your visions. 
Thank you for active participation, and I would like to wish all of us that we get as much knowledge from this uh, as we can. And in 30 years, I would like to see many of our graduates in important positions, and I would like to sit here in 30 years and be glad that we raised so many good graduates and that our work made sense. Thank you. And I would like to thank the speakers. Uh, I would like to thank I would like to thank Dana Kovaříková, head of the European Commission representation in the Czech Republic. Thanks to Jaroslava Rezlerová, General Director of Manpower Group in the Czech Republic. Thanks to Mr. Igor Mesinsky, partner and uh, CEF in MNA and KPNG. Thanks to Professor Jan Schweinar. And thanks to Marek Třeška, Executive Director of Hartmann Rico. I would like to thank those without whom it would be impossible to organize this event. The Vice Dean, uh, who's responsible for the preparation of this event, a lot of work, really. Many thanks, but the thanks go to the whole preparation team, implementation team. I would like to thank Aleš, moderator, who led us through the day, Aleš Kohout. And I would like to thank you for the time spent with you. And I would like to quote David Market, captain of the U-boat, marketer, to be able to open to the world, and we need to be uh, open to inspiration. So. Please be welcome to raise the glass with us and the Dean.